Good to be here this morning with you in the 8 o'clock service. You know, it's been a couple of years since I've had the privilege of speaking in a main service here at the church. That's because when COVID came, uh, we started having a bunch of breakout different services going on in different locations, and we started a family service that met over here in the gymnasium where we allowed kids to come with their parents, and everybody was together as a giant family. And so we created this family service. Well, when we got back to normal... Several folks said, we'd like to keep doing a family service, and so we do. Every single Sunday at 11 o'clock in the community center, we do a family service, and I am generally over there after I've done my youth group duties at 9.30. I'm the pastor of Student Ministries. I've been attending Faith now for 14 years. It's hard to believe it's been that long, and 12 years now I've been working in our youth group. You know, one of the things that happens occasionally at our house, not often, but occasionally, is that sometimes mom and dad have a hard time getting on the same page. I'm not the only, I'm not the only family that has that happen, right? Is, is that true? Okay, so occasionally there'll be a little bit of different desires for the day, usually on a Saturday when mom makes a chore list that's like 40 pages long and dad knows that there's a ball game he wants to watch, and all of a sudden those two things go into conflict with each other. Well, I can remember a couple of years ago that my wife and I were having one of those kinds of days where there was just a little bit of a conflict that was starting to develop there. Suddenly, our five-year-old daughter, Chirsty, burst into the room and said, I need you to come with me. So she walked us out into the living room. And there in the living room, she'd taken out her little play tea set and set it up around the table that was there, and she had poured some tea, which was really just some sort of water or something she had found somewhere, put some cheese crackers on a little plate, and sat us down in chairs. And then she said this, it seems we have a squabble here. (laughs) I've never used the word squabble before. I have no idea where she got that from. And so then she sat down and she said this, Dad, I want you to tell me five reasons why you're thankful for Mom. (laughs) Mom, five reasons why you're thankful for Dad. All right, we got through that. Dad, five reasons why you love Mommy. Mommy, five reasons why you love Daddy. And then she said this, it is important that we all get along in this house. I don't know where she heard that. (laughs) You know, I hope you've taken on the challenge of reading through the entire book of Philippians in one sitting. In fact, if you were to do that every single week, just sit down and read the entire book of Philippians in its entirety in one sitting, it would take you about 15 minutes a week, and it would help you to understand the themes and where we're going each week in our sermons. And in our sermon last week, you might have noticed that Paul was starting to point towards the importance of unity among the believers in the church of Philippi. So as you read through the rest of the book of Philippians, you'll catch on to the fact that the unity of the church might be at risk thanks to a squabble. That's right, Philippians 4, 2 through 3. I urge Yodia and I urge Syntyche to live in harmony in the Lord. Indeed, true companion, I ask you also to help these women who have shared my struggle in the cause of the gospel, together with Clement also and the rest of my fellow workers, whose name are in the book of life. What was happening here? Apparently, there was some sort of squabble that was beginning to happen between these two women in this church. You know, there's nothing more incredible than watching a group of believers who function in unity. It's incredible to watch a church be unified. I loved last church family night when there was a show of unity as our church stood over the 3121 ordinance that was proposed in West Lafayette. I loved to see that unity. I love the shows of unity that's demonstrated as hundreds of volunteers will show up to pull off things like the Living Nativity or Christmas for Everyone or the BCTC conference, which we just finished, or Vacation Bible School. I love seeing the smiling faces of church members as they work together to serve the Lord weekly in various roles. However, I've spent my entire life actively involved in churches, and at times I've been amazed by the lack of unity that exists among believers. 
others. You see, unity should be one of the defining marks of those who've placed their faith in Christ. I want to encourage you this morning to take your Bibles and turn with me to Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2, that's page 154 of the back section of the Bible located under the chair in front of you if you need that this morning. Philippians chapter 2. I'm going to read verses 1 through 11 this morning. Therefore, if there is any encouragement in Christ, if there's any consolation of love, if there's any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and compassion, make my joy complete by being of the same mind, maintaining the same love, united in spirit, intent on one purpose. Do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind regard one another as more important than yourself. Do not merely look out for your own personal interest, but also for the interest of others." Have this attitude in yourself, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of men. Being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. For this reason also God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee will bow of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Now this year we've chosen as a theme for our church, growing in gospel gratitude. We've been working through the book of Philippians since the beginning of this year. Well, today I want us to encourage and consider how to encourage unity by growing in humility. How can we encourage unity by growing in humility? And we're going to look for three ways to develop gospel unity. The first way is this. Grow in unity by understanding the work of the gospel in your life. You know, throughout the entire first chapter of Philippians, we've been encouraged and challenged by the Apostle Paul's love and dedication to the gospel. We learned that Paul was in prison as a result of the boldness with which he preached the gospel. We learned that Paul was under the watchful eye of the Praetorian Guard in the prison in Rome. He'd wanted to bring the gospel to Rome. He'd wanted to bring the gospel to the house of Caesar, and he viewed his imprisonment not as a a setback, but rather as a blessing to be able to advance the gospel within the palace of Caesar. They thought they held him captive, but Paul had a captive audience to the gospel. In fact, we have reason to believe that there were converts among the Praetorian Guard. And we learned, though, Even though Paul had been faithful to the gospel, even though Paul had been faithful in preaching the gospel, there were actually other preachers speaking ill about Paul. Yet, what was Paul's attitude towards them? He was delighted because they were still preaching the gospel. Paul was torn over the idea of going to heaven to be with Christ or continuing to live on earth to continue to spread the gospel. And last week we learned that Paul found the gospel worthy of taking a stand for and, oh, He said that suffering as a result of the gospel was actually a joy. Well, today's passage starts out with several obvious statements to the one who understands the gospel. These are a bunch of phrases that are kind of like obviously phrases to a person who understands the gospel. Philippians 2, 1. Therefore, if there is any encouragement in Christ, if there's any consolation of love, if there's any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and compassion. Now, I'm sure you probably noticed as soon as we started reading that there was a key word here that said, you better check for context here. Does anybody know what that word was? Therefore, that's right. Anytime you see the word therefore, you need to stop and see what it's there for, right? So let's go back to the end of chapter one and see if we have any keys that will help us to understand this passage. Philippians 1, 27 through 30. Only conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or remain absent, I will hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit, with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel, in no way alarmed by your opponents, which is a sign of destruction for them, but of salvation for you, and that too from God." 
For to you it has been granted for Christ's sake, not only to believe in Him, but also to suffer for His sake, experiencing the same conflict which you saw in me and now here to be in me. Do you pick up on the, what the context seems to be pointing towards? He said, live worthy of the gospel, standing firm in one spirit, with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel, standing against your opponents because of the gospel, and suffering for the cause of the gospel. Paul's trying to get everybody on the same page. Here's what he's saying. He's emphasizing the importance of unity within the church, the unity that must be there. So let's take a look at these obvious statements that we have here that become motivators for gospel unity. We're going to see four legs on which we will stand in unity as a result of the gospel's work in our lives. First of all, is there any encouragement in Christ? The word encouragement is paraclesis. It has the root meaning of coming alongside someone to give assistance by offering comfort, counsel, or exhortation. This idea of coming alongside of someone to help them works in many ways. Have you ever had a really true, close friend who cares deeply about you? It could be a spouse, it could be a parent, it could be a peer, it could be a mentor. They're there for you no matter what it is that you need. When life is hard, they comfort you. When you're unsure what to do in life, they counsel you. When you are being stubborn and living your life wrong, they exhort you. That's the kind of friend we all want. Someone who is right there coming alongside of us. Did you know that God was aware that that was something that we would need as well? You see, this word encouragement, paraclesis, results in God ultimately with our salvation sending us a paracleton or another helper. John 14, 16, I will ask the Father and he will give you another helper that he may be with you forever. The first leg that points out that we ought to be standing on comes as a result of having the same Spirit, the Holy Spirit. In other words, believers all have the same helper. We have the same comforter. We have the same counselor. We have the same exhorter. So we should be able to find unity because we have one spirit. The second leg is this. Is there any consolation from love? You know, this consolation of love is very similar to the idea of the encouragement in Christ. And in fact, the idea of consoling love comes from paramuthon, which has the literal meaning of speaking closely with someone and with the added idea of giving comfort and solace. So how has Christ demonstrated consoling love to us? How has Christ demonstrated this consoling love? Well, through salvation, right? Romans 5, 6 through 8, for while we were still helpless at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For one will hardly die for a righteous man, though perhaps for the good man someone would dare even to die. But God demonstrates his own love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us right? What greater consolation of love is there than that? That Christ ultimately created a way for us to be restored to God. Have you ever experienced a sense of unity that comes as a result of being in a similar situation with someone else? You may remember this. Actually, the last time that I got to preach in church, I was sitting here in a wheelchair. I was going through a lot of medical issues with some infections in my feet. And so as I was going through those physical challenges, it required me to have almost daily medical attention. So I'd have to go to the wound clinic, and almost every single day I'd have to go to the wound clinic where they would change my bandages and do all kinds of upkeep to make sure that the infection was going in the right direction. And I tried to schedule my appointments to be as close to the same time every single day so that it would just be easier to remember. Well, guess what started to happen? I started to notice the same people also scheduled the same time and would show up on the same time, on the same days, at the same place as me. And we started to care for each other. We started to develop a relationship and a friendship based on our common struggles that we were going through at that moment. We comforted each other when the doctor would have to change our treatment plan. We encouraged each other on the days when we were struggling just to get into our appointments. 
And you know what's awesome? We cheered for each other when we were finally able to be cleared. What, what happened? We were stuck in the same place. We had the same similar situations going on, but ultimately we began to bond together to console each other and to build this relationship. We had unity there. Let me say this to you. No matter where you sit in the auditorium today, if you are a believer, you have one thing in common with every other believer in this room. You needed a Savior. We sit here knowing that without Christ, we would be hopeless. We all needed the ultimate demonstration of love in order to be made right with Christ. So he's given us this consolation of love. The third leg is there. Is there any fellowship of the Spirit? Fellowship has this idea of partnership. You know, God has, the Lord has given us the Holy Spirit for us to have fellowship with. And believers have the fellowship of the Spirit in their lives. Well, we know this because we're told we are the temple of the Holy Spirit in 1 Corinthians 6.19, or we are sealed by the Spirit in 2 Corinthians 1.22, or we are empowered by the Holy Spirit in Acts 1.8, or we produce spiritual fruit as a result of the Holy Spirit in Galatians 5.22-23. We are strengthened in our weakness by the Holy Spirit in Romans 8.26. So let me say this, if we all share the same fellowship with the same Holy Spirit, then certainly we ought to share fellowship with each other. The fourth one, is there any affection and compassion? Because of God's great love, He showed us His grace and mercy. And all who have been saved by grace through faith have experienced the affection and compassion of Christ. Let me ask you this. Has the Lord brought you encouragement when you've been downcast? Has His fellowship been real when others have forsaken you and you felt all alone? Has His consolation elevated your spirit and picked up your heart? And praise God for the times you can look back and you can say yes. And pray that these realities might be more and more the realities of your experience and the realities that you rest on. Colossians 3.12 says, So as those who have been chosen of God, holy and beloved, put on a heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. We who have received the affection and compassion of Christ ought to be known for our own affection and our own compassion. By the way, if you're sitting here today and you hear all these references to salvation, these are four incredible things that come as a result of salvation, and you say, man, I have never experienced that, then let me encourage you to consider today to be the day that you would accept Christ as your personal Savior. You can talk to one of us. One of the pastors will be glad to talk to you. There is nothing we will do today that is more important than talking to you about getting your life right with Christ. Brothers and sisters, let me say this. Let us live united under the gospel. May we recognize the bond that we who have, Christ, who have accepted Christ as our personal Savior ought to have. Let us set aside our opinions, set aside our differences, and instead focus on the unity that ought to define us. Let us view each other through the lens of brother and sister in Christ. So now we've seen four effects of the gospel that stand as our anchor points. But now let's look at the unity that should come from our understanding of the gospel's work in our life. And here are some of the indicators of gospel unity. Verse 2 says this, Make my joy complete by being of the same mind, maintaining the same love, united in spirit, intent on one purpose. Now remember this. Paul is currently sitting in prison. He doesn't say this. Make my joy complete by bailing me out of prison. He doesn't say make my joy complete by doing whatever it takes to find a way for me to be free. No, what is he thinking about? He's thinking about how much joy he will have by hearing of the unity within the Philippian church. He cares about their spiritual growth far more than his current situation. So let's look at these four indicators. First of all, being of the same mind. And one of the key indicators of unity is when people have the same focus in their mind, right? They're 
focused on the same thing. This is true in athletics. If you can get a team focused on the same thing, you're going in the right direction. In office environments, if you can get everybody focused on the same thing, in your families, in your church, the good news is this. God gives us the things we need to be of the same mind about. Do you realize that? Like, as we read his word, he tells us the things we should be of the same mind about. Let's just notice a few of them. Philippians 4.8, finally, brethren, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is of good repute, if there's any excellence and if anything worthy of praise, dwell on these things. So if we all keep our focus on what's true, honorable, right, pure, lovely, and of good repute, then unity will be easier because at least we'll all be thinking the same thoughts. Or how about Romans 8? four through five, so that the requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. For those who are according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who are according to the spirit, the things of the spirit. If we all individually put our focus and our efforts on the things that are pleasing to God, instead of the things that are pleasing to ourselves, then suddenly we find ourselves focusing on the same things. Or how about Colossians three, verse two? Set your mind on the things above, not on the things that are on earth. So let me ask you this. Are you willing to commit to having your mind tuned into the things of God over the things of this world? If so, that will be the first indicator that there is unity amongst our church. A church that is standing on the same thoughts will be unified. The second mark of unity is maintaining the same love. There ought to be a common love that comes as a result of the work of the gospel in our lives. Romans 12, 10 through 13 says this, Be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Give preference to one another in honor, not lagging behind in diligent, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. Rejoicing in hope, persevering in tribulation, devoted to prayer, contributing to the needs of the saints, and practicing hospitality. I have the privilege of being the baby in my family. I am the youngest of six, six of us. The two brothers, three sisters. There is a special bond that we have as a family. I care for my siblings with a special love that comes as a result of our relationship. When they weep, I weep. When they need prayer, I pray. When they are rejoicing, I am rejoicing. When they need help, I help them. When I see them, I serve them. What motivates me to love my siblings like this? Well, it's this family bond of love that we have. The Bible uses this idea for how we ought to be relating to each other as well. We ought to have this brotherly love, this bond that is there, that when we see one weeping, we weep with one. When we see one that needs encouragement, we encourage them. When we see one that needs serving, we serve them. We're looking out for each other because we love each other. We are focused on this. Here's a a third thing that we ought to be looking for in our unity is we ought to be united in spirits. To be united in spirit is to live in selfless harmony with fellow believers. By definition, it excludes personal ambition, selfishness, hatred, envy, jealousy, and the countless other evils that are the fruit of self-love. Now, this does not mean that we will all agree on every single issue. Some in this room have very different opinions on all kinds of things that ultimately should not affect our unity. For instance, Ford versus Chevy, or Purdue versus IU. You're both wrong. It's University of Illinois. (laughs) Cubs versus Cardinals. Catch up on a hot dog or eat it the way you're supposed to. Winter or summer. Right? We, we can have all kinds of different opinions, but here's the goal. Even though we have these differences in those areas of life, we'll still not allow those things to separate us when it comes to a relationship with each other as a result of our relationship with the Lord. Here's the fourth factor of unity, intent on one purpose. As you can see, the four of these indicators kind of overlap with each other, but you could summarize this unity as this. Having one mind, one love, one spirit, one purpose. Living 
for the glory of God. So as we reflect on our salvation, it ought to result in our unity within the church. But Paul's not done teaching us how to be unified yet. In fact, he devotes the next several verses to teaching us how we can grow in being unified. By, well, we can grow in our humility in order to strengthen our unity. Philippians 2, 3 through 4 says this, Do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind, regard one another as more important than yourself. Do not merely look out for your own personal interest, but also for the interest of others. I have a love for sports. And currently in our family, this results in a love for youth sports. I've had the privilege this last year of coaching youth baseball and youth basketball over the last year. One of the things I've learned and try to teach the children I get to coach is this, the importance of individual humility to help strengthen the team unity. If one player is all about their own statistics, then it won't be long before they are only using their team selfishly to exalt themselves. And obviously it won't take long until that's the thing that destroys that team. The same is true for a church. If we're exalting our own desires, our own thoughts above the one mind, one love, one spirit, one purpose that we should be unified over, then it won't be long until there is damage that is being caused by that. Humility is not a natural response in life, but it's a very important part to our unity as a church. He says this in verse 3, Do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit. Do you know ultimately selfishness is found at the root of all sin? It's this idea of self-exaltation or self-preservation. In fact, the way it was used in the text here is referred many times to a politician who would do whatever it took to keep their position of power. It's this idea of me being in charge. It's common among us to want to place ourselves over every other person we come in contact with. But what's this passage tell us? We should be doing nothing out of selfishness. Here's an incredible example of selfishness and the ultimate fall that happened as a result of it. Isaiah 14, 12 through 17. How have you fallen from heaven, O star of the morning, sun of the dawn? You have been cut down to the earth, you have been who have weakened the nations. But you said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven. I will raise my throne above the stars of God, and I will sit in the mount of the assembly in the recesses of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will make myself like the Most High. Nevertheless, you will be thrust down to Sheol, to the recesses of the pit. And those who see you will gaze at you. They will ponder over you, saying, Is this the man who made the earth tremble, who shook the kingdoms, who made the world like a wilderness and overthrew its cities? who did not allow his prisoners to go home. Obviously, this is the story of Lucifer's fall in heaven. He got so entangled in his own power and position that it resulted in him rebelling against God. He tried to elevate himself to the position that only God can hold. Now, how many times does our selfishness result in the same exact attitude? Every sin is ultimately an act of selfishness. Every sin is ultimately a challenge to the rightful position of God. Every sin ultimately believes the lie that I can be a better God in my life than God can be. Every sin ultimately believes that God is withholding something from us that we deserve. And if we live our lives with this attitude of selfishness, then it will result in all kinds of unity issues. If I have a me-first attitude, then how will I ever work together with someone else? If I have the attitude that it's trying to be for me first, then I will say things that put other people down. If I have a me first attitude, then I will do things to exalt me at the cost of hurting others. So friend, let me ask you a question to consider this morning. Are you willing to live in a way that does not seek first your own happiness, your own prestige, and your own importance over others? Well, how do you do that? Well, with humility of mind, regard others is more important than yourself. I just want you to see a few passages here that talk about the importance of an other's first approach to life. Galatians 6, uh, 2. Galatians 6, 2. Uh, Bear one another's burdens and thereby fulfill the law of Christ. Romans 12, 10. 
Be devoted to one another in brotherly love, giving preference to one another in honor. What are these telling us? We should be thinking about others as more important than ourselves. See, care for another person is at the heart of a right relationship to God. And all rebellion against God is inevitably linked to corresponding disregard for others. I I mentioned I have the privilege to serve as the youth pastor here at our church. One of the things we try to teach our kids is that others are more important than we are. So how do we do this? Well, we put an emphasis in our youth group on serving. We would rather put more energy into providing serving trips and doing serving opportunities than we would on teaching your kid how to go bowling. Sure, it's great to have fun doing those things, and we enjoy those things, and relationships are built there, but the most important thing that we do is teach our kids how to serve. And we talk about this often. Repeat this phrase. We'll say this, you are more important than me. Well, isn't that how we're supposed to live our lives, brother and sister? Are we not supposed to look at everybody else around us and say, you are more important than me? Everything in our Christian lives is designed to produce a greater humility in us. The Word of God sanctifies us, promoting humility as a mindset. The cross tells us that we all bring ourselves, all we bring to our salvation is our sin. It is impossible to enter the Christian life with pride. Prayer puts us on our knees before God with empty hands. Worship causes us to look up to God, which puts us in our proper place. Our trials humble us, reminding us of our human frailty. And yet, despite all of this, our hearts still struggle not to feel proud. Our default position is to exalt ourselves, despite all the evidence that there is nothing about which we should be proud. So we need to take Paul's words here to heart, just as he stated them to the Philippians for their growth. So we need to affirm them to ourselves for our own growth today. Since we have all the encouragement and consolation and fellowship of Christ through His Spirit, we should see others not as opportunities to bring glory to ourselves, but as people we can serve in order to bring glory to Christ. Since we know the affection and compassion of Christ, we must aim to calculate others' interests and needs as far above our own as our Savior did for us. Friend, how are you doing at developing an others first mentality. When we're thinking about others instead of ourselves, we'll see an incredible amount of unity among the church. Thirdly, let's follow the example of Christ. Philippians 2, 5 through 11 says this, Have this attitude in yourself, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, But he emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of men. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. For this reason also, God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee will bow of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Sometimes as a preacher, you can find yourself struggling to come up with just the right illustration. You want something that will draw the application of the point out for the listener. Sometimes they're funny, sometimes they're serious, and sometimes you fail on both accounts. But I think that most preachers would share this experience People will forget the entire point of your sermon, but will remember that incredible story you told about your puppy dog. Well, here's what happens in this passage. Paul needs to drive the point home. So what does he do? He goes to the perfect illustration of humility. Christ, the humble servant. Let's look at the ways that Christ demonstrated humility for us. First of all, we're told that he existed in the form of God, or a a better translation of this phrase might be this, being in very nature God. John 1, 1 through 2 says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. So what does that tell us? Jesus was always God. John 17, 5 
Now, Father, glorify me together with yourself with the glory which I had with you before the world was. See, Christ has always been God. From eternity past, Jesus was fully and truly divine. From before time began, he's always possessed all of the divine perfections that belong to God alone. Jesus was in the form of God from before the foundation of the world. And the divine perfections that have belonged to the Father are also the eternal possession of the Son. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, is co-equal and co-eternal with God the Father. So he was in that position. He did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped. In other words, he willingly decided to fulfill the Father's will by leaving heaven, his rightful position, to come to dwell on earth. So we're told that he emptied himself. There are a couple of defining descriptions of Jesus as he emptied himself that are important for us to understand. We're told that he took on the form of a bondservant. A bondservant owned nothing. They were completely dependent on the one that they served. Christ did not even claim ownership over the very things that he had created. Instead, everything that he did on earth was about the Father's will. We're told that he was made in likeness as a man. He came and lived in a body like the body you and I live in. He felt hunger, tiredness, sorrow, and pain like we do, yet he never decided to abandon the goal of ultimately dying on the cross for us. Let's just pause here and make a couple applications for us today. Matthew 20, 28 says, Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. You see, Christ becomes the ultimate example for us as he lives his life, not for what he can gain, but instead for whom he can serve. John 13, 14 through 17. If I then, the Lord and teacher, washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I gave you an example that you should also do as I did to you. Truly, truly, I say to you, a slave is not greater than his master, nor is the one who sent greater than the one who sent him. If you know these things, you are blessed if you do them. So let me ask you, Should we not then have the stature of one who is willing to serve first? If Christ, who had his rightful position as God, humbled himself to serve. In other words, don't look at your schedule and decide that you're too busy to serve. Instead, look at your schedule and decide that you need to serve more. Don't look at others and decide that they ought to be serving you. Instead, look at others and determine to serve them. Be like Christ, serve like Christ, have compassion like Christ. I love to see families serving together. Last Saturday, we had the pre-conference in here for the BCTC conference, and there were tables set up in here, and there were chairs set up in here, and I was moderating the online discussion and answering some questions with Pastor Wetterlin of people who had been a part of that pre-conference. My responsibility was to get a crew of people together to come help reset this auditorium. Well, The questions kept coming, and they kept coming, and they kept coming, and I started to look at my clock, and I realized I was now 30 minutes past the time when I was supposed to meet people here to reset the auditorium. I walked in here 35 minutes late to the fact that several families had reset the entire auditorium with complete joy in 35 minutes. You know how awesome it is to see people serving together? I could go on. I have several examples listed here, but that time right there tells me I don't have enough time to tell you the rest of them. But there are examples after examples. You know how much joy it is and how much you're teaching your kids to be like Christ when you take your kids and help them to serve? It's an incredible thing. We're told that Christ became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. By the way, he did this willingly. John 10, 18, no one has taken it, my life away from me, but I lay it down on my own initiative. I have authority to lay it down and I have authority to take it up again. This commandment I receive from my Father. 
or John 15, 13, greater love has no one than this, that one lay down his life for his friends, or Romans 5, 6, for while we were still helpless at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. Christ became the suffering servant who served to his very death. What an example for us. You realize that because of that, we can never claim that our serving hurts too much. Christ served to the point of death. Do you realize we can never claim that we do not need to serve? Christ, the Messiah, served. What happened as a result of his humility? Well, Christ became the exalted Lord. God's exalted him above all creation. He's seated at the right hand of God the Father. God has made all whom Christ came to serve ultimately submit to him. They will bow before him. And God has made it that all who will worship God must confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. So how can we learn to grow in gospel gratitude? Well, let's grow in unity by understanding the work of gospel in our life. Let's grow in humility to strengthen our, humili- our unity, and let's follow the example of Christ. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this, the ultimate illustration of humility as we see in Christ. Lord, I pray for our church that you would help us to be unified. Help us to have a love for each other and a care for each other and a bond that is rooted in our understanding of the gospel and the unity that must come as a result of that. Lord, help us to be like Christ, to serve like Christ, to love others like Christ, to live with an other's first attitude. And we ask all these things in your name.